Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. This is the John F. Kennedy Assassination 60th Anniversary live stream History Program. Thanks so much for being here. Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Robert Kellerman. I'll be your host. I'm the founder and director of the Washington, D.C. History and Culture Nonprofit Community Organization, which is kind of like our, say, flagship organization. And we also have an organization in Dallas, which is called Dallas, Texas History and Culture. A little bit about myself. I'm Mergie from Washington, or Mergie from Detroit, Michigan. I lived in Southern California and Washington, D.C. before moving to Dallas, Texas. And I've hosted a lot of tours, both in person and online, related to presidents and first ladies. And this particular one in the Kennedy assassination is the latest one. If you're ever in Washington, D.C. or the Dallas-Fort Worth area, I hope you can come by and see us as we have a lot of fun visiting these different historical sites. So last night, this morning, and this afternoon, I led three different uh, John F. Kennedy assassination-themed in-person tours in Dallas, um, and we'll probably do that again um, next year. So that's the story with that. I also have my good friend from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, joining us, Patty. Hi, Patty. You want to say hello and introduce yourself? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Yeah. I'm not. I'm playing with a new device, so I'm not getting everything to work right. <laughs> so bear with me, guys. <laughs> um, how are you all? I before I forget, I just want to mention if people didn't um, find out about it, the History Channel is doing a three part thing, not on the assassination, but more on his life and career from his birth to um, just before he. Um, won the presidency so uh and okay. i think it's like running tonight but they do like they keep they keep running them back to back to back so people can tune into it after they get off here <laughs> excellent well thanks patty thanks for joining us and we also have our good friend brad joining us from west virginia hi brad you want to say hello and introduce yourself hello robert hi patty uh hi everybody this is brad i'm uh I was lucky enough to be in high school when Mr. Kennedy was shot, so that was probably one, the the most memorable event other than graduating that happened to me during my high school career. Oh, that's so, interesting. What <laughs> what happened? How did you find out the news? I'm sure, I'm assuming they made an announcement that let everyone go home. I was going to an orthodontist, and I was going to school in Avon, Connecticut, and I had to go into Hartford to take the train down to to Meriden to go to the dentist and um, I was looking at the state capitol when both flags quickly went to half mast and then I went into the train station you know how the train station echoes well the guy who normally announces the number eight train going to point south was announcing that the president had been, had been killed so oh my God. it was like a kick in the gut just as I was about to go for a dentist, which isn't exactly my favorite activity either. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that story for you, Brad. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, I greatly appreciate it. So thanks um, to you and Patty for joining us. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so this is a two-part program if you're watching this live. So in part one um, of the live program and the recording, we're going to give like a little brief historical context of the Kennedys. Um, we'll talk about their trip to Texas. Um, the assassination, of course, and then a lot of interesting things happened after the assassination. So kind of the uh, ramifications of that event. And then if you're watching us live, part two will be we're going to actually watch some videos. Um, so like the Walter Cronkite um, announcement, the Zapruder film, uh, President Kennedy's a brief snippet from his funeral, kind of et cetera, et cetera. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, so the oh, we had a little bit of noise in the background. Mute everyone. Okay. Um, let's see. So again, the Kennedy assassination, uh, really kind of one of the um, monumental moments of the 20th century, not just in the United States, but had ramifications throughout the world. And historical context. So the 1960s, a very turbulent time, and we lost four great American leaders in just a four and a half year span. So John F. Kennedy was assassinated November of 1963 or 60 years ago. Uh, Malcolm X was assassinated February 1965. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated April 8, 1968. 
and Robert Kennedy was assassinated in June of 1968, so a very turbulent time in America. And interestingly enough, the Kennedys, at the time they uh, were traveling to Texas, had just recently celebrated their 10-year wedding anniversary. So they were married in Newport, Rhode Island on September 12, 1953. And then President Kennedy was killed on November 22nd, 1963, so a little bit more than 10 years later. And the Kennedys are what I and many other people like to call the first modern first couple. So they really uh, got a lot of media exposure, um, both print media, and television, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so these are some examples of different magazine covers they were on. Their popularity or their media exposure uh, wasn't limited to just like American news publications. So for instance, uh, here's an example of them on the cover of Sports Illustrated, uh, Jackie on the cover of Ebony Magazine, uh, and then on the far right, they're on a news or a magazine cover from France. Um, and so all this kind of media coverage was much more intense. And it's really kind of been that way ever since the president and the first lady, whoever it is, get a lot of media attention and scrutiny. Um, and then this is also right around the time that television came into play in America. And it really kind of coincides with the Kennedys. So if you look at, this is an interesting chart. This is American television ownership from 1946 to 1970. So you can see in 1950, uh, not even 10% of the households in the US had a television. But by 1960, when the presidential election was uh, 87% or almost 90% um, of American households have a television set. And of course, John F. Kennedy was elected in 1960. And can you think of any like famous television moments or even video moments um, from like say President Truman's administration or President Eisenhower. Uh, so Truman and Eisenhower, great presidents, um, but didn't really have a lot of like video uh, or television type moments that are kind of etched in our minds, so to speak. But there's quite a few with President Kennedy just because his administration uh, used to be kind of the dawn of the television era. And if you think of so many events that the Kennedys were involved in, that were televised or recorded uh, on video and shown later. There was the Kennedy-Nixon debate. Uh, there was John F. Kennedy's famous inaugural address. Where he said, ask not what you can do, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. There was Jackie's famous um, television tour of the White House. Uh, of course, President Kennedy's assassination was captured on the Zapruder film. And then the funeral even uh, was a massive television event, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. So the Kennedys really the first modern first couple. And again, you have the Kennedy-Nixon presidential debate, the inauguration, Jackie's White House tour, and then even the assassination was recorded and then received a lot of extension television coverage. Uh, many of you have seen the Zapruder film. Walter Cronkite announcing to the world that President Kennedy had been shot and then later announcing that he had died. And then even the funeral. Um, so all these kind of video slash television moments with the Kennedy is uh, really kind of makes them the first modern first couple, so to speak. Now, why were the Kennedys in Dallas in the first place? Uh, well, this is an interesting story, especially for someone like myself, currently living in Texas. Oh, you know, someone else pointed out, uh, Teresa made a good point, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, that was another big television moment, wasn't it, Teresa? So thanks uh, for pointing that out. But why were the Kennedys even in uh, Dallas or in Texas to begin with? So just to FYI, um, C-SPAN does this really cool thing where every few years they rank all of the presidents to see which one is the best, which one's the worst, uh, and which ones are in the middle. And, and this top kind of 10, so to speak, has been pretty consistent throughout history. Um, so this is a whole set of historians that rank presidents on all these different criteria. They did it in 2000, 2009, 2017, 2021. You can see Abraham Lincoln 
consistently comes out as our best president. Um, and here's John F. Kennedy. Um, he's been very highly regarded by historians for a long, long time. Uh, he's currently ranked the eighth best president after these seven. However, uh, President Kennedy wasn't quite as popular uh, when he was alive. So for instance, this is the 1960 presidential election and Kennedy won this election by a very small margin of people. In fact, if you took away or the count the fact that uh, Kennedy won the states of Illinois and the state of Texas by a combined 55,000 people, and so if there were, say, 27,500 people fewer that voted for Nixon instead of Kennedy, Nixon would have won Illinois and Texas, and that would have swung the vote to him, uh, and John F. Kennedy would have lost the 1960 presidential election. And then if you look at JFK's approval rating, he was, for the most part, pretty popular, uh, during his time in office. I think Jackie had a little bit to do uh, with that to a certain degree, not entirely. But you can see by the time he was taking his trip to Texas, his popularity was at a low point. And there was a lot of concern that he would not win re-election because his popularity was really uh, diminishing at this point in time. Now, it's kind of funny because in modern times, uh, there's been a lot of recent presidents that would love to have a 58% approval rating uh, because we haven't been anywhere near that in the past several years, but that's a whole nother story. Um, and John F. Kennedy is running for re-election in 1964. So it hadn't been like officially announced and they hadn't kicked off the campaign. Uh, they started political or campaigns a lot later uh, than they do now. But November 1964 election is less than one year away. And Texas, of course, is a very important state. And so John F. Kennedy kind of is going to informally kick off the reelection campaign, or I guess as they would say in marketing, he was going to do a soft launch, so to speak. And then also his wife, Jackie, was really popular. Uh, in my opinion, Jacqueline Kennedy, the most popular first lady in history, in American history. Um, and so whenever she would travel with President Kennedy, it always really increased the media attention and the public interest um, in what was going on. She didn't always travel with President Kennedy, but she did frequently. And wherever, wherever either one of them went, they drew a crowd. And when the two of them were together, they really drew a big crowd. Um, and you can get a sense of that by just looking at the uh, magazine and television and newspaper coverage of their travels uh, just looking at pictures like this of people lining up to see them um, now unfortunately 15 weeks before president kennedy was killed their child died so they had a son named patrick but he only lived for 39 hours when he died and this is just 15 weeks prior uh, to President Kennedy's death. And at the time, this was a really big um, news story because the president and first lady uh, lost a child. They had two children, of course, that were already living at this point in time, but big, big news. Um, but this event really kind of gets overshadowed by the assassination that took place later on. Now, uh, Jacqueline had had a lot of health problems related to this miscarriage. And I'm sure that she was probably extremely uh, depressed by the fact that she had lost her son, Patrick. And so uh, she is really kind of a recluse for the weeks after um, Patrick's death. She was recovering both mentally and physically. So she really hadn't been seen much in the fall of 1963. Um, and then it's decided, you know what? Um, she's kind of uh, back in good enough health, so to speak, she can travel. Um, and hey, it would be really great if she could accompany her husband on this trip to Texas because she's so popular. Um, and so that's actually what happened. So when Jacqueline Kennedy um, in her famous pink Chanel suit ends up uh, accompanying President Kennedy, uh, she really had not been out in public much in the 15 weeks before that. So interesting historical footnote. And so this Texas trip is really kind of the unofficial kickoff to the 1964 reelection campaign. And Jacqueline's going to participate uh, 15 weeks after the death of their son, Patrick. So that's kind of the historical context of the trip. And then I thought this was really interesting. What did the Kennedys do 
the last night that they were together in the White House in Washington, D.C., well, they had a Christmas reception um, and they invited friends and family over um, and other kind of dignitaries. And they kind of showed off the uh, Christmas tree inside the White House. Uh, so here's John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy, and they're posing in front of the Christmas tree. Now, this isn't the national Christmas tree that's outside. Uh, this is more of a, like a private family tree that's inside. But an interesting picture of the two of them. And this is really the last kind of, um, say, public photo of the Kennedys in the White House. Because the next morning, they're going to get on Air Force One and travel down to Texas. And here they are, off away. And then after the Christmas reception, they went upstairs to the private quarters of the White House. And they signed Christmas cards. So if you're old enough to remember that tradition of writing out Christmas cards and signing them and putting them in envelopes and stamps. Well, of course, the president and first lady have a lot of Christmas cards to send out. So they're going to start the process early. Um, and so on the evening of November 20th, after this Christmas reception, they went upstairs and started the process of signing some of the Christmas cards that they were going to be mailing out. And of course, these cards were never actually mailed, but an interesting historical footnote. And let's talk about the Texas trip. So this is the itinerary. Uh, they weren't just in Dallas. They actually visited a few other places and they were going to go to a couple other places after Dallas. So they left Washington, D.C. Uh, Thursday morning. They flew to San Antonio. They were there for several hours. Then they went to Houston for several hours. And then late in the evening, they flew to Fort Worth, spent the night there, um, got up the next morning, went to Dallas. And then after Dallas, they were supposed to go to Austin um, and then to the Lyndon Johnson Ranch, which is west of Austin. But of course, they did not make it to those two locations because President Kennedy had been shot. And then if you're not familiar with the geography of Texas, let me give you a quick lesson of the Lone Star State. So they flew into San Antonio Thursday afternoon, stayed there for a while. Then they went to Houston. Then in the evening, they flew to Fort Worth. They were there through the following morning. Then they went to Dallas. Um, and of course, that's where the assassination took place. And then after Dallas, they were supposed to go to Austin and then the Lyndon Bain Johnson Ranch. And so they left Washington, D.C. If you're familiar with D.C., they flew out of Andrews Air Force Base. This is on Thursday morning. And there's Jackie and President Kennedy getting ready to board the plane. And so this was the last time President Kennedy would be in Washington, D.C. alive. Um, the next time he would return here would be um, in his casket, unfortunately. There's a close-up of them. It was kind of a rainy, dreary day, ironically enough. And then they fly to warm and sunny San Antonio, Texas. And these other cities in Texas, San Antonio, Houston, and Fort Worth, I can tell from personal experience, they are all very proud of the fact that they hosted the Kennedys uh, on this last trip. Um, so here they are at the airport. Uh, this is the Beast, uh, the presidential limousine that they'll be using throughout their trip. It's been flown in ahead of time, uh, so they can participate in that. And here they are getting off the plane. So these particular photos of John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline, I see these frequently in different media contexts, but they're not always um, identified as being part of their Texas trip. I think perhaps it's because um, Jacqueline looks really stylish uh, as usual. Uh, and they were really beaming on this trip with big smiles. So here's the two of them. Like for instance, I see this picture in media contexts um, websites and magazines and stuff on a regular basis. And if you didn't know where this picture was taken, it was when they landed in San Antonio. And this is about, mm, uh, this is less than 24 hours before the assassination. And of course, big smiles and it's warm and sunny. There were a lot of dignitaries came out to greet them.
And it's really just uh, fascinating to look at these photos of them, uh, knowing what tragedy is about to take place the following day. And remember, Jackie had not really been out in public all that much prior to this, so it was good to see her uh, looking happy. And they get greeted by a lot of dignitaries. President Kennedy looks very happy. There's a Boy Scout. <laughs> People are commenting in the chat and Q&A about uh, their fashion and the style, and the clothes and stuff. It's really kind of timeless um, in that regard. But yeah, look at the big smiles on their faces. And a lot of people, of course, came out to greet them. And then they're getting in the limousine. Jackie was famous uh, for wearing gloves, like a lot of women did back in those days. You don't really see that too much anymore. And they go on this motorcade through the streets of San Antonio. Um, so this is actually outside a school, uh, elementary school. And they announced the route in the newspapers um, for the president's trips. This was something that they had done before. Um, so this is outside an elementary school. Uh, the kids have gotten out to see the president and they're all waving. I really like this guy over here. He's standing in the back of his truck uh, to get a better view. But, you know, here they are cruising through the streets. Now, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, the fact that uh, President Kennedy was um, shot uh, in the convertible, oh, he shouldn't have been doing that. But they had been doing this for a long time, like a lot of other presidents and first ladies. It wasn't that big of a deal because there had never been any problem. And if you go to San Antonio, if you're either uh, – living there or go to a visit. I really love San Antonio, uh, really fascinating history and culture and the people are really super friendly. But if you get a chance, you should check this out. So they actually put a historical marker where the presidential limousine passed through this part of town. And again, they're really kind of proud of their uh, role in this particular trip. And so this gentleman, uh, he's actually pointing out to some friends of his uh, where he's at in this photo. Uh, so that's kind of cool that, you know, he was there and he's kind of showing this photo was from a few years ago and he's showing them where he's at, at in the photo. And so this is a historical marker. And then this is from the newspaper. Um, so they landed at San Antonio International Airport, which is north of downtown. And then they traveled to a place called Brooks Air Force Base. And President Kennedy gave a speech at Brooks. And then they went to Kelly Air Force Base. And then from there, they flew on to Houston. So it was kind of a real whirlwind trip. And there's that photo again. This is perhaps the most famous photo of the trip to San Antonio, perhaps because it's in front of the school children, or perhaps because of the guy waving in the bed of his pickup truck. <laughs> And then here they are traveling through the streets of San Antonio. If you've never been to San Antonio, I uh, really recommend coming down and checking it out. Great city. Of course, there's the Alamo there and the Riverwalk and uh, a lot of other cool things to see and do. And here they are. And, you know, look at all these people lining the streets. Um, so this is a good kickoff to this unofficial reelection campaign start. Um, and it's interesting seeing the motorcade with... Um, you know, the Secret Service, and these are members of the press, uh, you know, and look at these people up here in the balcony, and just tens of thousands of people saw the Kennedys on this trip without incident uh, before the shooting in Dallas. And then here's the motorcade approaching. And here they are turning. I mean, look at how close... Um, President and Mrs. Kennedy are uh, to the crowd. I mean, yeah, there's some policemen there and stuff, but, you know, there hadn't really been many issues uh, um, with people doing this type of stuff. Now, I think maybe in modern times, we kind of shocked, like, oh my God, they shouldn't have been doing that. But, you know, this was a different era. 
And here they are more driving through San Antonio. And then here they are at the Air Force Base where President Kennedy is gonna be giving a speech. Um, and then you can see Lyndon Johnson here. Of course, Lyndon was from Texas as well. And there, just everyone looks very happy. Look at these photos of the early part of the Texas trip. There's just all these smiles and laughing, and et cetera, et cetera. And then here is dedication speech. So this was at 2.30 p.m. So this is 22 hours before the shooting in Dallas, and he's dedicating a site known as the Brooks Aerospace Medical Division. And so that's what his speech was for. And um, there's a lot of people remember this speech, like children were let out of school uh, and stuff like that. A lot of dignitaries showed up, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you have to remember, um, this is kind of the early television era, but this was before the internet, before CNN. So a lot of people um, would not have been familiar with like hearing the president like, yeah, maybe they watched the uh, Nixon Kennedy debate or maybe they watched the inaugural address. But like seeing and hearing the president was not like a regular occurrence. So when the president would visit uh, your hometown, uh, people are much more likely to want to come out and see uh, them in person uh, than they would today. And then after that speech, they left and went to another Air Force base and and kind of also had another brief motorcade. And then off they went. And then here's the media coverage. Thousands give JFK rousing San Antonio welcome. And then even in Dallas, they were covering the trip. So plea for space plan kicks off JFK tour. Um, now notice, uh, Here's a map of what's going on, the San Antonio address. And then the same day, they flew to Houston, and they're off, getting off the plane. You can tell the Houston photos from the San Antonio ones, because by this point in time, it's a lot later in the day. Um, so if you ever see one of these pictures on the internet, you can kind of maybe guess when it was taken just by looking at kind of the time of day it was. So again, kind of a similar process. They get off Air Force One. Uh, they're greeted with flowers and dignitaries and all that kind of stuff. Oh, hold on, just one second. I can tweak something on my computer. And yellow rose, which is an important flower in the state of Texas. And again, it's warm and sunny, great weather for this particular trip. Texas, of course, is a lot warmer in November than Washington, D.C., where they were coming from. And again, big groups of people. says we lost our innocence then convertible never used again for presidents i think yeah very different look at the smiles on their faces it's like they're uh, amazed to see these big crowds of people because um uh every president uh has admirers and detractors no there's no uh, presidents that have been loved by everybody um, at any point in time in history. And so uh, President Kennedy, no exception. Uh, so I think they were really surprised by the number of people that came out and the kind of fabulous response they got uh, from the crowds throughout Texas. Especially when his approval rating had been going downhill so much and the fact that he had just barely won the state of Texas um, in the 1960 presidential election. And then kind of a similar thing, you know, travels through the streets of Houston in a motorcade.
this is interesting. Um, a lot of people do this with historical sites. Uh, they'll take a historic photo and then they'll line it up with the kind of the current view. So this is the Kennedy motorcade traveling through downtown Houston, uh, what it looked like back then and then overlaid on a photo of what it looks like in more recent times. Oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Um, then kind of a similar thing. And again, this look at all these people uh, lining up. So um, hey, if there was a presidential motorcade today, uh, regardless of your political um, uh, interests, would you go out and see the president and first lady if they were traveling through in the motorcade? Maybe not so much just because of the internet and 24 hour news cycle and all that stuff, but a really big deal for people uh, back at this point in time. And then Jackie actually gave us, President Kennedy gave a speech in Houston, but Jackie also gave a speech and her speech was in Spanish because some people don't know this, Jacqueline Kennedy was fluent not only in English, but also in Spanish, Italian, and French. Um, and so if you're watching the live program, I'll actually show a snippet of the speech a little bit later and look out for that. And greeting the crowds. And then they get on the plane. And by this point in time, it's pretty late at night. I mean, it's been a long day. Uh, they left Washington, D.C. in the morning. They flew all the way down to San Antonio. They were there for a few hours. And they flew to Houston. They're there a few hours. And then now they're flying to Fort Worth. So a really, really long day for the Kennedys. And then they arrive in Fort Worth, Texas. Fort Worth, if you're not familiar with the geography of Texas, is not far from Dallas. That's why they call all of the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area. And they're going to be staying at a place called the Hotel Texas. Uh, the Hotel Texas is no longer in existence, but this building is still there. It's the Fort Worth Hilton in downtown Fort Worth, if you know where that is. And here it is in more recent times. And so this is the hotel that used to be the Hotel Texas. It's now the Fort Worth Hilton. And right outside the entrance is this memorial to President Kennedy. And I'll explain more about that in just a moment. And the Kennedys stayed in room 1530, which is now all the presidential suite. So at the time it was the nicest suite in the whole hotel. It still is today. And so if you're visiting Fort Worth, you can stay in the presidential suite, the same room or set of rooms that John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy spent their last night together in Fort Worth, Texas. And here's a picture of the room. I mean, wow, yeah, look at this hotel room. This is not your, not your uh, typical hotel room. You can see they have the portrait here of President Kennedy on the wall. And wow, look at this big dining room table. And the, armchairs and the view and all the really cool furniture. And then this is the bedroom. It looks a little bit different now, but uh, the local community, um, a bunch of individuals got together and they collected uh, famous artwork uh, by artists like Vincent Van Gogh and hung the walls with famous uh, artwork it was housed in like local art collections. Uh, and so the Kennedys had kind of like a mini uh, art museum <laughs> waiting for them when they showed up. If you wanna learn more about that topic, we don't really have time to get into all the details for that, but there was an exhibit um, of the Kennedy artwork at the Dallas Museum of Art several years ago. So if you wanna learn more about that, check that out. Um, here's a postcard from the Hotel Texas. Kind of give you a sense of what it would like. Check out these cool cars out in the parking lot. And then this was the entrance of the hotel. And President Kennedy, the next morning, Friday morning, Friday was the day he was killed. He gave, gave an impromptu speech uh, outside the hotel. And so what happened was um, President Kennedy was going to be giving a speech at this hotel to the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce later in the morning. But when he woke up, his staff told him there were all these people, uh, between two and 3,000 people waiting outside, hoping to catch a glimpse of either him and or Jackie. And, um, now, it had been raining, uh, <laughs> which made the fact that there were two or 3,000 people standing outside even more impressive. And his staff said, you know, maybe you should go out and, like, I don't know, give him an impromptu speech or something. 
them. So that's what he ended up doing. So he wasn't planning on giving a speech outside of the hotel, but because the crowd had showed up, uh, he decided that what he was going to do. So here's the sign. Um, if you haven't been to Fort Worth before, their motto is where the West begins. And here's President Kennedy and several other dignitaries going out. And again, big crowd of people. And this must have been a big uh, relief for him to see all these uh, happy people and the number of people coming out to see him. And here he is getting ready to make a speech. And here he is delivering his remarks. That's Governor, Texas Governor Conley and Vice President Lyndon Johnson standing in the background. He kind of talked about the strength of America during the speech. And look at all these people. And then look at this picture, look at the mass of people. I mean, if someone wanted to harm President Kennedy, it would have been very easy to do because you see pictures like this um, over and over again during this trip, um, but you know, never had never had a problem, nor had any other presidents in recent history uh, had a problem. There hadn't been a presidential assassination in over 60 years since William McKinley had been assassinated in 1901. And a lot of people just kind of thought that the presidential assassination was just kind of a uh, random thing, wasn't going to happen again. This is the memorial outside of the um, Fort Worth Hilton. So if you're ever in Fort Worth, uh, make sure you check this out. It's in downtown Fort Worth. And it's a really nice memorial to President Kennedy. It has uh, excerpts from his speech, uh, photos from his visit, uh, this nice sculpture. And again, San Antonio, Houston, and Fort Worth, they're very proud of the fact that they hosted the Kennedys. I've talked to numerous people in those three places, and I can vouch for that personally. Um, so really interesting in that regard. Here's the sculpture. And then here's a historical marker. On the evening of Thursday, November 21st, 1963, President and Mrs. John F. Kennedy arrived in Fort Worth to spend the night at the Hotel Texas, their last night together. Uh, early the next morning, President Kennedy made an unscheduled outdoor appearance and surprised the crowd that had gathered here, hoping to see him. At breakfast in the hotel, he spoke to 3,000 people, emphasizing Fort Worth's role in defense and aircraft production. He accepted with good humor the city's traditional welcome gift of a locally made Shady Oaks Western hat, also known as a cowboy hat. Uh, the president trip around Texas, though billed as non-political, was surely brought about by infighting among Texas Democrats. Following breakfast on November 22, 1963, the president and his entourage left the Hotel Texas in a motorcade to Carswell Air Force Base for a short flight to Dallas. On the drive to a luncheon speech in Dallas, President Kennedy was assassinated, bringing shock and grief to Texas, the nation, and the world. And here is President Kennedy speaking at the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce. So this is inside the Hotel Texas. Um, you can see Jackie here. He's delivering his remarks. Here is an excerpt from his speech. President Kennedy, one known as uh, one of our best speakers, if not the best speaker of all our presidents, and he said on this particular occasion, I am confident as I look to the future that our chances for security, our chances for peace are better than they have been in the past. And the reason is because we are stronger. And with that strength is a determination to not only maintain the peace, but also the vital interests of the United States. To that great cause, Texas and the United States are committed. Thank you. And that was the last speech President Kennedy ever gave. There's Jackie and Lyndon Johnson. And then here they are departing the Hotel Texas. Again, big smiles. If you're familiar with 
Fort Worth, or even if you're not, here's the sign. And here's Jackie wearing her iconic pink Chanel suit, which is going to become famous in a short period of time. And here they are traveling through the streets of Fort Worth. So again, look at all these people. Uh, this is the motorcade. Now this is towards the back of the motorcade. This is the press um, and other dignitaries. But I mean, look at all these people. If someone wanted to do something, it would have been very easy to do. And here they are. And so this is John F. Kennedy uh, waving goodbye to the people of Fort Worth as he boards Air Force One. And again, and big smile. It must have been a very happy time for him up to this point, just to see the response from the people uh, that he had encountered. And then they're off to Dallas, and this is where tragedy strikes. Dallas, Texas, Friday, November 22nd, 1963. It'll be 60 years ago this coming Wednesday. So this is a timeline of events that took place. So 1138 was when Air Force One landed at Love Field in Dallas. The presidential motorcade departed a few minutes later. Um, they kind of stuck around Love Field to greet dignitaries and things like that. And then President Kennedy was shot at 1230 p.m. So less than an hour after Air Force One landed. And of course, there was a large group of people there to greet them. People applauding and cheering. And this is a particular article is talking about the storm of political controversy swirls around Kennedy visit. And then we'll look at this later. This is actually the map of the motorcade route through Dallas. That might be kind of shocking to people in modern times, but that was a thing back then. They hadn't had any problems. And so if you're wondering why all these people were lining the streets, uh, it's because the presidential motorcade route was heavily publicized. So people knew uh, where they was going to be. I mean, that was part of the point to go out and see people. And there's the route. They did the same thing in San Antonio and Houston. And of course, not everyone was a fan of President Kennedy's. All presidents uh, have people that like and don't like them. That's just the way it goes in that office. And so there were quite a few protesters that showed up as well. And then here they are departing Air Force One in Dallas. And then here they are with the crowd greeting them. And a big deal was made about the fact that um, Mrs. Kennedy was giving yellow flowers, but there were so many events going on with the Kennedys, there was a shortage of yellow roses um, and so she ended up receiving these red roses, which ended up being ironic. And so here she is with the red roses because they had, in Dallas, they had run out of yellow roses. You got to remember at this point in time, 1963, Dallas wasn't nearly as big of a city as it is now. And there were a lot of like receptions and things going on throughout the city. Um, so the roses they had available to give her were red. And she actually made a comment on that later. She said, every time we got off the plane that day, three times, they gave me the yellow roses of Texas. Yellow roses are a really important flower in Texas. There's songs written about them and poems and books and stuff. But in Dallas, they gave me red roses. And I thought, how funny, red roses. So, all, And then after the assassination, so all the seat, meaning the back seat of the limousine, was full of blood from her husband and red roses. So an ironic part of the trip. And then let's talk about Jackie's pink Chanel suit because it's so famous. Made of wool, the double-breasted raspberry pink and navy trim collared suit was matched with a trademark matching pillbox hat and white gloves. 
In the early 1960s, the Chanel suit was a wardrobe staple of the upwardly mobile American female. It evoked a powerful image of sophisticated, intelligent, and independent modern woman and could fit almost every daytime occasion that required a woman to dress stylishly. Given that the Chanel suit was a strong statement of an independent woman, it is balanced by the color pink, which has an element of traditional femininity. Most of the American public viewing pictures of the presidential couple on television and in newspapers would not have known the color of the suit, given that at that time, TV news and newspapers were in black and white. The color of the suit did not become widely known until the publication of color photos in Life Magazine's JFK Memorial issue, November 29th, 1963, or seven days after the assassination. So imagine that. Uh, people didn't really know about the pink Chanel suit for seven days. Eventually, the suit, which was never clean, was given to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. It shall not be seen by the public until at least 2103. I've heard that that might change, um, but the suit has never been publicly displayed. It's going to be interesting to see what happens to it. I don't expect uh, to ever see it in any time in the near future, maybe not even in our lifetimes. Um, and then what they would do with it, I don't know, would they put it on display at the Smithsonian? I'm not really sure. Um, we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, the most iconic items of clothing in American history, perhaps? I don't know. Can you think of a woman's clothing item that's more famous than Jackie's pink Chanel suit? I don't know. It's a good question. Um, now, Jackie had worn this suit a few times before. This is not in, this photo is not in Dallas. It's in Washington, D.C. I think this was from the previous year. Um, Jacqueline was working on a project to restore uh, Lafayette Square, which is across the street from the White House. And so she actually wore the suit on that occasion, ironically enough. And one of the ironies of this photo is Lafayette Square in Washington, D.C. is one of the legacies of Jacqueline Kennedy. She helped preserve it. They were going to tear this historic area down and replace it with office buildings. And she thought that was shocking. And she got involved and used her uh, powers of persuasion, so to speak, as first lady uh, to prevent that from happening. And so interestingly enough, at this particular event, she's wearing the pink Chanel suit. And then here it is in a fashion magazine from back in the day. Hold on for one second. Sorry about that. And the tweet comes on my computer. And then again, arriving at the airport at Love Field. Love Dallas, um, Fort Worth area is the Dow DFW airport is the more well-known airport. That's the larger airport that was built after uh, this point in time. So 1963 Love Field was the main airport. And so that's where they flew into. And again, look at the big smiles. And then again, look at this mass of people. So if you can't see the Kennedys, here's President Kennedy here. And then here's Mrs. Kennedy here. And it's Texas, so there's a Confederate flag. Hmm. But yeah, look at all the people turned out. They actually uh, took longer to depart the airport than was initially scheduled just because there were so many people and the Kennedy stopped to greet many of them. So they left the airport uh, Love Field later than they were supposed to.
And this is where President Kennedy was intending to go. So he's going to travel in a motorcade through Dallas, and then he's going to give her a speech at the Dallas Trademark. And this was going to be a big luncheon reception. So here's a picture of the luncheon arrangements. And of course, President Kennedy did not make it here. And then after the trademark speech, he's going to have that plane fly down to Austin and give a speech there. You can see, welcome President John F. Kennedy, which of course he did not make it there. And then after that, he was going to go spend the evening at the Lyndon Johnson Ranch, which is west of Austin, Texas. All right, let's talk about the motorcade. So here they are at the airport. And here's President Kennedy. This is the position he'd be sitting in when he was shot. Um, Governor Conley, Jacqueline Kennedy, you can see the yellow, or the, sorry, the red roses right here. And they're getting ready to head out. And then here's the car. This is the presidential limousine where pre that President Kennedy was traveling when he was shot and killed. It had three different configurations. So what they could do is they could put the hard top on it. This was usually the way it was used, so hard top. Uh, they also had this glass bubble top that they could use if they wanted to, um, or they could use this convertible. So it could be hard top, glass bubble top, or convertible. Of course, this particular day they're using it. It's convertible. And the Kennedys had been in a lot of motorcade over the years. This is a really touching photo. A lot of people comment about the Kennedys and their marriage and were they really in love and all that stuff. If you look at photos of them, uh, it does really seem, in my opinion, like there are a lot of love between the two of them. So a really touching photo of him uh, smiling at Jackie and she's smiling back at him and brushing her hair back. This is not from Dallas, by the way. This is an earlier photo. And then this is when he was still um, many years before he was running for president. They're in a motorcade in Massachusetts. So I just kind of want to show you some photos that traveling in motorcades, as shocking as that may seem to us today, that was a common thing back then, uh, especially when you have a charismatic couple like the Kennedys. Here's a parade. Here's another one. So the, the motorcade in Dallas was not an unusual event. This is President Kennedy just a few weeks before he was killed. Um, this particular day, he's traveling through the streets of Washington, DC. Uh, look at all, all these people on Constitution Avenue or sorry, on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, coming up to see the president. And then even Jackie, sometimes in a motorcade by herself. So this is when Jacqueline visited India uh, by herself. Well, she went with her sister, but she didn't go with President Kennedy. I mean, look at this. She's traveling through a foreign country in a convertible. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy didn't have any problems. And then the Kennedys visited Mexico. Again, Traveling in a motorcade, no problem. He visited Ireland, motorcade, convertible, no problem. So I wanted to show you these photos because it wasn't unusual at all uh, for him to be traveling like this. And even presents before him had frequently done this. It just was a thing that people did. And then here they are going through the streets of Dallas. And also through the streets of Dallas. If you're in Dallas, I believe this is the motorcade traveling down Main Street, if I'm not mistaken. This is a view uh, White House photographer took from the press car that was traveling behind the president's car. President Kennedy is up here. And this is probably the most famous or one of the most famous photos um, of that day uh, before the assassination took place. And again, just look at all the people and everyone's smiling, uh, President Kennedy, Jackie, and this is just literally moments before he was shot. And 
and we're going to talk next about Lee Harvey Oswald. But before we do, uh, let's check in with Patty and Brad. Pat, Brad and Patty, anything interesting going out there? Any observations thus far before we talk about the actual shooting itself? I am struggling with my device here, Robert. So okay, no <laughs> I problem. I'm just happy you're here. With all the correspondence. But uh, That's okay. yeah. No problem. Just happy you're here. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm just struggling. <laughs> I'm not that electronically uh, gifted. Uh, but yeah, th this was somebody had asked, and, uh, you know, what made us interested in this? Those of us who were alive at this time, there is just no explaining the level of sheer shock and horror that we all muddled through. So, um, yeah, it, 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 there's just no explaining it. If you if you weren't alive at the time, maybe you can't grasp what this was like. But it was just horrifying, and it affected everybody profoundly. Okay, thanks, Brad. Brad, what about yourself? Anything that you've observed so far? All right, well, let's continue on. Let's just hold that one second. Nope. Hold on, my screen share got interrupted. Bear with me for a moment. All right, let's talk about Lee Harvey Oswald. He was the guy who shot President Kennedy. And if you haven't been to Dallas, this is where the shooting took place. So this is the Texas School Book Depository. This building was owned by the Dallas School District, and they used to house textbooks in here. Lee Harvey Oswald actually worked here. It was on the motorcade route, and it's a seven-story building. Oswald fired three shots from the sixth floor window right here. And you can visit this site today. It's a museum now. There's a marker right here announcing the fact that this is the site. Um, the motorcade came down this way towards the building and then made a left. Oh, hold on. I lost my sharing thing. Bear with me. Let me go back. Okay, sorry about that. Now we're back. Um, so again, this is a map of the area. Uh, the motorcade traveled this way and then made a left turn. And this is the Texas School Book Depository. The shots were fired from the sixth floor of a seven-story building. And you can visit this site today. And it was from this window. So the floor, the sixth floor, where the shots were fired was a, essentially a storage area. And so Oswald positioned boxes um, so that no one could see what he was doing. And then he armed himself with a rifle that he had brought to work, disguised as curtain rods. And when the motorcade traveled through, he opened fire and killed President Kennedy. And the motorcade traveled the route of these blue arrows. It was traveling towards the building made a left turn. And then this is the view from the sixth floor window. So the motorcade came down this way, made a right turn, came down here, made a left turn on Elm, proceeded down Elm Street. Now at this point in time, the trees weren't as tall. And so Oswald would have had a great perspective, unfortunately, of the motorcade. And then when the Kennedy motorcade got to here, that's when the shots opened fired. And Oswald fired three shots. I believe the first shot missed. Um, and then the second shot hit President Kennedy in the back and exited his neck. And then the third shot was the fatal head wound. And then here's a view from another angle. So here's where Oswald was. The motorcade came down this way, turned right, traveled through here, made a left turn, and then traveled this way. So um, I led tours last night and this morning of this site. And one of the many ironies of this case is the fact you can't see it in the photo, but the freeway ramp is like right here, pretty much. Uh, they were like 99% done with the motorcade. If it would have gone just um, 
uh, cut short a few seconds earlier, they would have been on the freeway and they would have been gone uh, because between the freeway, there wasn't really any um, you know pedestrians looking out or anything like that. So the one other irony is they were almost done with the motorcade. They've been driving around for about 35 minutes um, when the shots rang out. This is a photo from back in the day. And then here's that famous photo again, moments before the assassination. And then now this is right before the assassination. This is literally like a couple seconds before the shots started to ring out. Here is Clint Hill. He was the gentleman who famously, over the Secret Service, who famously ran up to the Kennedy's car and jumped in the back to protect Jackie. And this is right before the shooting took place. Again, see all these happy people. Uh, Jackie looking off to left. President Kennedy is looking at the crowd. Here is where Clint Hill was standing. And here comes the motorcade. And then one of the reasons why the assassination is so well known is because of the Zapruder film. So Abraham Zapruder owned a clothing company uh, across the street from the building where Oswald shot President Kennedy. Uh, Zapruder was a big fan of President Kennedy's and he was a video buff. Uh, not a lot of people had video cameras back then, but he did. Uh, and I actually bought one of these model video cameras and I was showing it to people on the tour um, in downtown today. So that was really cool uh, to be able to see that. But anyway, he gets out of his office and wants to go check things out. The Zapruder film is a silent eight millimeter color motion picture sequence shot by Abraham Zapruder with a Bell and Howell home movie camera. As the United States President John F. Kennedy's motorcade passed through Dealey Plaza, in Dallas, Texas on November 22nd, 1963. Unexpectedly, it ended up capturing the president's assassination. Even though it is not the only film of the shooting, the Zapruder film is considered to be the most complete one, giving a relatively clear view from a somewhat elevated position on the side from which the president's fatal head wound is visible. It was an important part of the Warren Commission hearings and all subsequent investigations of the assassination and is one of the most studied pieces of film in history. And here's an advertisement for this camera. It was the Bell and Howell Model 414. And there it is. Um, so I have one of these cameras. I went and bought one just because I was curious what it was like. It's amazing. The viewfinder is really small uh, compared to like looking through a modern phone that people would take videos with or pictures with. And so again, the motorcade came down Houston Street, turned left onto Elm Street. Here's where Oswald is. And Zapruder was perfectly positioned to capture the events that took place. And remember the Kennedys, the first modern first couple, all these video slash television moments during their lives in the White House. And here is the Zapruder clip. I'll actually show, if you're watching this program live, I'll actually show the Zapruder film a little bit later. If you're watching a recording of this program, um, you can find it on YouTube, various other sites. And again, this television moment, you've probably seen this film before, at least stills of the film. At this point in time, President Kennedy has been shot once uh, in the back and the uh, bullet exited his throat, um, but it's before he received the fatal head wound. And you can see Governor Connolly uh, leaning back to see what the heck is going on. And then here's a, another view from the opposite side. You can see President Kennedy slouched over. This is the area known as the Grassy Knoll, if you've heard of that before. And then here's Clint Hill springing into action. So he actually jumped off the car behind uh, the president's. He was standing on the sideboard 
and raced on foot up to the car and somehow miraculously caught it. Uh, it's amazing that he was able to do that because had he slipped, well, it's just amazing that he was able to run fast enough uh, in black dress shoes to be able to even catch up to the president's car. Um, but had he fallen here, he would have fallen behind the limo and been run over by the car behind him. So he really risked his life uh, just to do that. And not only that, this is an active shooting scene. Um, so he could have very easily been shot himself. So he risked his life uh, really in two different ways, uh, taking this action. And then here he is in the back of the car. And you know, I must also remember at this point in time, the drivers of the car realize uh, they're being shot at. And so they speed up the car. So he really had to hold on for dear life uh, to avoid falling off. And then, of course, there's pandemonium taking place after the shooting. People wondering what the heck is going on. And then if you visit this site, they actually have two X's on the street uh, where President Kennedy was struck. And here's the building today in more recent times. And this site is called the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. You can go visit it. I really highly recommend uh, if you're in the North Texas area to come check it out. And if you're not in North Texas, area, you come down and pay us a visit and see it yourself. It's a really great museum. And then a couple blocks away, they have a memorial to President Kennedy. It was assigned by the great American architect, Philip Johnson. And here it is. So this is two blocks away. Some people that go to the Sixth Floor Museum don't realize this is here um, or they don't have time to visit it and they miss it, which is unfortunate. And then if you're wondering what happened to the car that President Kennedy was traveling in, it was actually continued to be used as a presidential limousine for many, many years into the 1970s. Um, but it's now on display at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, which is my hometown. Dearborn is a suburb of Detroit. So if you get a chance, make sure you go visit the Kennedy car at the Henry Ford Museum in my hometown of Dearborn, Michigan. Now, after the Kennedy assassination, they were not going to be using it anymore as a convertible. Um, so they converted into a hard top. I kind of wish they would turn it back into a convertible, but maybe uh, that's just too much trouble, or maybe there's some um, legal ramifications for doing that. But anyway, um, so you can't see it as a convertible, but it's still interesting to see the car nonetheless. They have a lot of programs about the car, et cetera, et cetera. And then these are some photos from Parkland Hospital where President Kennedy was taken after the shooting. Um, so look at this. Now at this point in time, people don't realize he's been killed. They just know he's been shot. The motorcade rushed to the hospital. Parkland Hospital is just a few minutes away from where the shooting took place. Of course, they were traveling at full speed. Um, but look at the roses that Jackie had been given. They're strewn all over the back seat um, because of all the commotion that had taken place. And then look at these shot people. Oh, my God, what's happened here? And the police, some of the Secret Service trying to get control of the area. Here's the emergency room. Here's where the limo pulled up. And so people know what's going on. They know the president's been brought here. He was sh shot. Um, and they're waiting to find out what's happened or any more details. You can kind of tell when the photos were taken um, by, by looking at the expression on the people's faces. If they're looking very tense, uh, it was before in, they was announced that President Kennedy was killed. Um, if they're crying and things like that, it was after the announcement. Now, of course, the president being shot and brought to the hospital um, and shot in the head, 
people would have known that was pretty serious. But at this point in time, people really don't know what's going on. This is long before the internet and the 24-hour news cycle. And then the doctors do all they can. President Kennedy was alive when he got to the hospital, but he was essentially, uh, they knew as soon as they started examining that he wasn't going to make it. Um, it was just a matter of time. So he ended up, they determined uh, 30 minutes after he was shot, he was shot at 1230. They made the determination uh, he wasn't going to make it shortly thereafter. Uh, and at one o'clock, he was pronounced dead. Um, and then a short time later, they announced it to the public. And so here's the doctors. They're explaining what the situation is with the death of President Kennedy. And this part of the story is really um, depicted really nicely in the film Parkland, which will be screening on Monday night. So if you get a chance, come check that out with us. Parkland, of course, the hospital where President Kennedy was taken to, and where he was pronounced dead. And so then here's our timeline. So the limousine arrived at Parkland five or six minutes after the shooting took place. Walter Cronkite, a few minutes later, announced the president had been shot, although at this point in time, he hadn't announced he was died. Uh, and then at 1 p.m., Parkland Hospital determined that President Kennedy um, had died and began announcing that within the four walls of the hospital, but they hadn't publicly announced it quite yet at that point in time. And so, okay, now you can really kind of tell like, okay, um, he's died. Just be kind of looking at the expressions of the people uh, in the photos. There's much more tension and grief uh, and things like that in the photos after it was announced he had died. And they're trying to set up the television cameras to report what's going on. And then this is a touching photo. This is actually Robert Kennedy's house uh, back in Virginia. Um, Robert Kennedy lived in a suburb, a Virginia suburb outside of Washington, D.C. Um, and so he was actually home at this point in time. Uh, he did not travel with his brother to Dallas. And so he was notified that his brother had been shot. And it just so happened he was outside with two of his children. And so you can see the three of them are comforting one another. And so this is Robert Kennedy finding out his brother's been shot. I don't think at this point in time he had actually um, been pronounced dead yet. And then, of course, Lyndon Johnson is on the scene. and wait to see what's happened. Um, now, once President Kennedy has been, um, it's been determined that he's dead, uh, now Johnson's next man up. He's going to be the president. And so if you remember the 9-11, um, you know, we've all processed that now. But when it was unfolding, people were wondering, you know, what the heck is going on? And kind of the same thing with this situation. People didn't know if this was a coup or the some foreign powers are attacking us or what's going on. So they wanted to get Johnson the heck out of here and get him. Uh, they thought it'd be safer if he was on Air Force One. Um, as opposed to on the ground. So they rushed him out of the hospital. And then Walter Cronkite comes on and announces to the world that President Kennedy had died. And then remember this photo from when President and Mrs. Kennedy are getting off Air Force One. There's another set of photos showing the opposite. So this was the arrival of the Kennedys in Dallas. <clears throat> and then these are the departure photos. So this is Air Force One. They just happen to be using an Eastern Airlines ramp. Um, this is President Kennedy in his casket. And you can see Jackie standing over here. And they're loading the casket on Air Force One. They didn't really have a good place to put it because they usually don't carry caskets on Air Force One. And then look at this incredible photo. This is Jackie getting on the airplane, uh, Air Force One, all by herself. And these photos are really haunting to me. And remember, Jackie, just 15 weeks earlier, had lost her son, Patrick. And now you fast forward to November 22nd, and now she's lost her husband. 
And so you contrast these photos, the big smiles, and they're arriving in Dallas. This photo was taken at 11.44 a.m. And a little over two and a half hours later, um, she's departing in the same plane, although her husband is dead in a casket. Um, so just really incredible um, photo, or set of photos, I should say. And then here's more of the timeline. So at 126, Lyndon Johnson departs Parkland Hospital for Love Field. Lee Harvey Oswald got captured an hour and 20 minutes after the shooting. We'll talk about his capture in a separate program, in more detail in a separate program. Um, president Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy depart Parkland Hospital. Lyndon Johnson sworn in as president at 238. Then Air Force One departs Love Field and it arrives back in Andrews Air Force Base outside of Washington, D.C. at 5.58 Eastern time. So everything unraveled very quickly. This is probably the most famous photo of the Kennedy assassination, even though it doesn't actually show President Kennedy. This is in Air Force One, and Lyndon Johnson is being sworn in as President of the United States. This photo was, incredibly enough, taken just two hours and eight minutes after President Kennedy was shot. And so imagine Jackie standing here uh, two hours and nine minutes earlier, her husband was still alive and she's traveling through the streets of downtown Dallas in a motorcade with her husband as first lady. And fast forward two hours and eight minutes and she's now standing in Air Force One. Her husband's dead. His blood is all over her suit and the vice president's being sworn in as president. So an incredible moment, an incredible photograph. And here's a colorized version. And then here's the Johnsons. This is Lady Bird Johnson and Lyndon Johnson comforting Jackie. She was asked if she wanted to see the um, oath of office. They were thinking that she probably wouldn't, but they would just asked her out of courtesy and then she actually said yes yeah, she would like to witness it um, but she was struggling as you can imagine and of course the state of shock throughout the plane the plane takes off and goes to Washington DC and of course this famous photo so I know a lot of people have seen this photo before but did you know it was taken just two hours and eight minutes after President Kennedy was shot And then Johnson now has to immediately start focusing on what he's going to do because he's now the president and they also don't know what's going on out the rest of the world. Uh, they didn't know if this was a one person act or a part of a larger conspiracy or some hostile foreign government attacking us. I mean, who really knew at this point in time? And here's Air Force One. This is actually not from that particular day, um, but this is the plane itself. You can go see it. It's at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. The National Museum of the United States Air Force. So if you get a chance and you're in southern Ohio, go to Dayton and visit the National Museum of the United States Air Force. And they have the plane that used to be Air Force One. And then this is a series of touching photos. So this, this is the plane now. Oh, it's arrived back at Andrews Air Force Base, which is right outside of Washington, DC. And what they're doing here is they're taking the casket of President Kennedy and his body off Air Force One. And then here's Jackie. Now, Robert Kennedy did not travel to Texas, but as soon as the plane landed, he immediately rushed on board to greet Jackie. He did not want her uh, coming off the plane by herself. And of course he wanted to see her and comfort her. Um, kind of shows you what kind of guy he was, his character. But yeah, look at them. She's watching um, them load the casket of her husband into the hearse. And you can see the blood on her suit and the anguish on her face. 
And of course, this was big news throughout the world. If you know anyone that was alive during this time, like your parents or something like that, your grandparents, uh, you should ask them if they remember what they were doing when it was announced that President Kennedy had been shot and killed. You usually get a lot of interesting answers. New York Times, Washington Post. Here's that famous photo again. I met a gentleman several years ago who actually used to work for President Kennedy. And he told me that this portrait of President Kennedy by the great American artist Norman Rockwell was the image that he thought best represented the way President Kennedy looked. Uh, so I thought I'd share this with you. So this was actually done when President Kennedy, uh, right before the election of 1960, and then they reused the picture for this memorial issue the Saturday evening posted in mid-December 1963. All right, let's talk about the aftermath. So what happened after President Kennedy died? There's quite a few interesting things that took place. So Lee Harvey Oswald, the shooter of President Kennedy, this is his mug shots from when he was arrested. He was only 24 years old. Um, his face has some injuries because 15 cops showed up at the Texas theater to arrest him. Uh, he got in a scuffle with him and 15 usually beats one and it did in this case. And so his face got a little damaged, so to speak. Um, I have a separate program I'll do about kind of how Oswald was captured and what he was doing and all that kind of stuff. But that's like a whole separate program. So we'll do that at a later date. And before Oswald was captured, he shot and killed Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett. Uh, um, so all points bulletin came out about a suspect uh, describing Oswald. And now they're still putting the pieces together at this point in time. But Tippett's driving down the road and he sees a guy fitting the description of the all points bulletin to be on the lookout for and so he pulls his police car over and questions the man um, from the passenger window. So the uh, police car uh, driving down the road pulls over, he uh, rolls down the window, he starts questioning Oswald. And then something must have caught his attention because Tippett got out of his car, police car, and he proceeded around the front of the car. And then at which point in time, Oswald put out, pulled out a Saturday night special revolver and shot him three times, and Tippett fell to the ground. Then Oswald, thinking that perhaps Tippett was gonna come around the front of the car and shoot him, Oswald ran around the back of the car and then shot Tippett one more time. Um, and you can actually see this is Tippett's blood um, here in the street. This is a crowd of people that have gathered uh, to see what the heck is going on. And this is Dallas police officer, J.B. Tippett. He was 39 years old. He was a World War II veteran, received the Bronze Star as an airborne trooper, and he was an 11-year veteran of the police force. And not sure all the details of what happened because he was killed. Um, and then, of course, Oswald was captured and killed himself a little bit later. And so Tippett's kind of like the unknown victim uh, or sometimes maybe like the forgotten victim of the Kennedy assassination, but it's really his death that leads to Oswald's capture because two different people saw this take place. Um, one of them ran inside her house and called the police. The other guy actually ran up to the police car and got on Tippett's radio and notified the dispatcher that there was an officer down. And this generated this flurry of police activity in this neighborhood. And so then they're out on the, really out on the prowl looking for Oswald. Um, when Tippett died, he left a young wife as a widow and three children behind. This is Mrs. Tippett and her th three children. She has since passed away, as has her, her oldest son, I believe. I think the two youngest children are still alive. They are mostly anonymous, as you can imagine. They don't like the limelight. Uh, in my opinion, I just don't really hear much about them. But anyway, 
Um, when Tippett died, he left behind a wife and three young children. And then, so Oswald starts uh, taking off down the street. A number of people see him, think he's acting kind of suspicious. Uh, there's all these police out looking for him. He ducks into the Texas Theater, which is a famous Art Deco theater in Dallas. Uh, a number of people see him acting really suspicious and see him sneaking to the theater. Uh, they call the police. Uh, the police are already looking for uh, the guy who shot the police officer. And 15 uh, officers storm the Texas theater, uh, find Oswald, arrest him. He puts up a fight. They're able to subdue him. The Texas theater is actually still in use today. So if you want, you can go watch a movie there um, where they have other special events. Um, this officer, this is a recreation, uh, or this photo was taken after the arrest, but this officer is showing uh, the seat that Oswald was sitting in in the movie theaters, kind of sitting in the center of the back. And he was watching a film called War is Hell. It's a trivia question. What film was Lee Harvey Oswald watching when he was arrested? It wasn't Gone with the Wind. It wasn't PT-109. It wasn't Star Wars. It was a film called War is Hell. And then here is the Texas theater. So 1.50 p.m. So just an hour and 20 minutes after the Kennedy shooting, Oswald's arrested thanks to local citizens of Dallas uh, who saw him and his different activities and suspicious behavior. Uh, and they notified the police. And that was the end of him in terms of being a free man. He's arrested. Um, he's held in the Dallas uh, police jail for two days. Uh, he's actually brought out in front of the public uh, like a press conference, which was a, a very kind of bizarre uh, thing to do. And he made a few statements. He denied involvement in anything um, and kind of said a few other kind of bizarre stuff. Uh, and then Jack Ruby enters the scene. Jack Ruby, a very famous individual in the Dallas area. He was not happy with Oswald, so he showed up on the scene. And when they were transporting Oswald from the Dallas police jail to the county jail, which they thought would be more secure, Ruby showed up on the scene with a revolver and shot Oswald. Ruby was the proprietor of a <clears throat> burlesque establishment, for lack of a better word. And so this is a famous photo. So this actually took place in downtown Dallas in the basement of the Dallas police headquarters. This photo actually won the Pulitzer Prize um, for journalism. So famous photo. And you can see the Oswald getting shot and reacting in pain as Ruby shoots him. So Ruby decides that he would like to save money and time on trials and take care of things by himself, which he does. And as my friend John Correa says, Lee Harvey Oswald took the room temperature challenge and died of the Jack Ruby gunshot. Ruby shot him one time in the chest and Oswald died. And this was just two days after the Kennedy shooting. Um, so that's the last chapter of his story. Uh, of course, this was big news throughout the world. Assassin Oswald slain in Dallas. Here's Ruby's photo down here. And here's the photo with the gun right there. And then they have President Kennedy's funeral. This is actually in the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. And then just some more pictures of the funeral. Jackie and her daughter saying goodbye to John F. Kennedy and paying their respects. Here's Jackie leading her. If you've seen, this is a famous photo. I frequently see this in different media contexts. Um, this is Jackie leading her kids outside of the Capitol. You can see Robert Kennedy there with her.
And then this is the casket being taken back to the White House. And then here it is on its way to the church. So there was a um, ceremony at the White House with President Kennedy's body and casket. And then the casket left. And it's on its way to the church. And again, I'll do a, another program on the like the funeral stuff at a later date. And here is Jackie and many members of the administration walking from the White House to the church. Here's another famous photo. Frequently see this one in different media contexts. This is Robert Kennedy, Jacqueline Kennedy, and Ted Kennedy. And then this is right before the famous photo where John Jr. gives the salute. So they had a ceremony at the church, and then they're outside, and they're watching the casket depart. And it's at that point in time that John F. Kennedy Jr. saluted his father. So you can actually go visit this church. It's just a short walk from the White House. If you get a chance to go visit Washington, D.C., or if you're already in D.C., you can check that out. And again, what a difference. So this was Friday afternoon in Dallas. And then this photo is Monday afternoon in Washington, D.C. Pretty much the whole entire country shut down that weekend and into Monday so that people could mourn and watch the funeral on TV and collect their thoughts and pay their respects, et cetera, et cetera. And then President Kennedy, of course, is buried at Arlington National Cemetery, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. Now, ironically enough, one of the many ironies of the Kennedy assassination, John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy visited Arlington National Cemetery just 11 days before he was killed. And if you haven't been to Arlington Cemetery before, it's a beautiful place. It has this spectacular view of Washington, D.C. It's elevated above D.C., and so you can look down and see Washington from a really great vantage point. And, and while they were there for a Veterans Day event, President Kennedy told Jacqueline Kennedy, quote, this place is so beautiful. I could stay here forever. And so then it was decided on what they should do with his body. Um, Jacqueline had a big fight with the Kennedy family. They wanted him brought back to Massachusetts and be buried there. She really um, put her foot down and said, no, he should be buried in Arlington Cemetery because it's in Washington, D.C. And because he thought this place was so beautiful and being the spouse, she was able to win uh, that fight. But there was a lot of opposition uh, from the Kennedy family in her doing that. And then here is the Kennedy grave site. So if you get a chance, you should check that out. And then, of course, here's the Potomac River with Washington, D.C. in the background, if you're not familiar with the geography of D.C. And I lived in Washington, D.C. for many, many years. I love it there. I really feel like it's my adopted home, or one of them. Um, so hopefully you get a chance to visit Washington, D.C. if you've never been there before. And then here's some photos from the funeral. There's Robert Kennedy. I'm crying. The flag and the casket. And then initially he was buried in a temporary grave site. And then later on, this site was developed in the memorial that's there now. So, of course, it took a while to build the memorials there now. So initially he was kind of in like a, say, a temporary grave site. And it's one of the most popular tourist attractions in Washington, D.C. And we have to thank. Jacqueline Kennedy for her decision to have President Kennedy, her husband, buried at Arlington. Nothing against the people in Boston, of course, uh, but it is nice to see him at Arlington Cemetery. And it really, Arlington Cemetery before President Kennedy was buried, there was a pretty well-known site. There were a lot of famous people there, buried there, but once President Kennedy was buried there, it immediately became a major tourist attraction. 
uh, it kind of went from being like, say, like the local regional um, tourist attraction, being like the international one. Like people come from all over the world to visit Arlington National Summit. They're not just to see President Kennedy's and Jacqueline Kennedy's graves. Um, there's a lot of other well-known, important people there, and, and a lot of great Americans are buried there. Uh, but this really kind of raised the stature of it. So we have to kind of thank uh, Jacqueline Kennedy for that. Here's the Kennedy graves. So over here is, so this is President and Mrs. Kennedy, their two graves. This is an eternal flame. Uh, this is their son, Patrick. He was reinterred here. And then uh, Jacqueline Kennedy had a daughter that was stillborn um, several years before the assassination. A daughter they were going to name Arabella. And she was reinterred here later. So if you're wondering um, what the situation is there. That's how that's set up. And there you go. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was born in 1917, passed away in 1963. And then one thing that some people don't know is that Jacqueline Kennedy was responsible for the Kennedy administration being referred to as Camelot. Um, she was interviewed a few days after the assassination by a friend of theirs who was a reporter uh, and a journalist and guys taking notes. And so President Kennedy was being described by his wife uh, during this interview. And she said, President Kennedy was strongly attracted to Camelot because he was an idealist who saw history as something made by heroes like King Arthur. At night, before we'd go to sleep, Jack liked to play some records. And the song he loved the most came at the very end of this record, The Last Side of Camelot. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. And then she goes on to say, there'll be great presidents again, but there'll never be another Camelot. And so the fact that the Kennedy administration is called Camelot is thanks to Jacqueline Kennedy. And if you're in Washington, D.C., sometimes people will be on the National Mall. They're like, how come there's no memorial for President Kennedy? There's like the uh, Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, and the uh, Martin Luther King Memorial, and the Washington Monument. How come there's no memorial for President Kennedy? Well, there actually is. It's the Kennedy Center. Um, so it's a little bit different type of memorial. It's a living memorial. Um, and John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy were uh, big fans of the arts. And so the Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C., the Kennedy Center, which is really like the national performing arts center for the whole country, uh, is dedicated to President Kennedy. So it's really kind of like a memorial to him. If you get a chance, uh, you should visit this site as well. I love, love, love the Kennedy Center. It has really stunning architecture, great performing arts programs, a uh, really spectacular place in so many ways. And so if you get a chance, make sure you check this place out. And of course, it has this famous sculpture of President Kennedy on the inside. And beautiful architecture. All right, so we're Washington, D.C. History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. Did you know that 99% of the people that participate in our programs do so for free? Uh, however, it's donations that help us continue our nonprofit programs because we have to pay for things like our meetup websites, our Eventbrite page, our Zoom link, et cetera, et cetera. If you ever want to make a donation to our program, you can do so by PayPal, Venmo, or we also have a GoFundMe account. Um, so your contribution is greatly appreciated. And as I mentioned earlier, President Kennedy, um, this was an interesting survey of historians by C-SPAN, and he was ranked the eighth best president in history when the survey was done last in 2021. And then here's a quote from President Kennedy. So this was the speech excerpt that he was supposed to give at the trademark, but he was shot and killed before he could give this speech. We in this country, the United States, in this generation, are by destiny rather than choice, the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. We ask, therefore, that we may be worthy of our power and responsibility that we may exercise our strength with wisdom and restraint, and that we may achieve in our time and for all time the ancient vision of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. So interesting, he's talking about goodwill 
um, in a speech that he was supposed to deliver, but he was assassinated. That must always be our goal, and the righteousness of our cause must always underlie our strength. For as was written long ago, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. So you can actually find um, full excerpts of this speech. This is actually just a section of it, the speech that Kennedy was supposed to deliver at the trademark. And then Jacqueline Kennedy, uh, she ended up living to 1994, and she had a pretty long life. She, of course, later on married Aristotle Onassis. Um, um, she left D.C. and relocated to New York and spent most of her remaining years in the Big Apple. Um, let's see, last year I was in New York City. I go to New York like, mm, I don't know, probably every year, and I gave a Jacqueline Kennedy tour of New York City. And I'm hoping to go back to New York City July of next year so that be july of 2024 for like fourth of july um so if i do we'll do our jacqueline kennedy tour of new york city so if you come out and check that out of course we talked about the camelot thing and john f kennedy born on may 29th 1978 he died on november 22nd 1963 60 years ago this wednesday all right so if you're watching the recorded program that's on YouTube, um, we're going to have to disconnect. Um, so thanks for joining us. If you're watching the live program on Zoom, sit tight because I have all these videos that I want to show you if you still have time to stay with us. Um, so that's the end of our recorded program. If you are watching this live, you can find the recorded program on our YouTube channels. It'll be on both our Washington, D.C. History and Culture YouTube channel and our new Dallas, Texas history and culture channel. So let me stop the recording. Thanks so much for all of you joining us. They're listening to the recording.